Welcome back learners. In this video, I'm going to be teaching you about arrays. Before I started programming, I had never really heard of an array before. And when I did, it kind of sounded like something out of Star Wars. Then when my teacher said that arrays existed in one and two dimensions, I felt for sure that we were about to learn some sort of futuristic-y secret weapon death starry thing. And I mean, to some extent I was right. Arrays are a super powerful programming skill to have in our arsenal because they allow us to store multiple values in a single variable. And you'll see why I say that in quotes here in just a little bit. But before we get into that, let's back it up a bit and talk about arrays and dimensions that are currently part of our real nonfiction world. So at this point in our programs, we've been using variables to store a single value, like this number here. One variable, one piece of data. If I wanted to manipulate this value or display it to the console, I could simply call it by its name, num. The same thing goes for all the other variables in my program, but at what point does it become too many variables? Could you imagine trying to keep track of every single one of these variables by name? There's gotta be a better way. It's why you're here today. We can store these in an array. You guys like my rhymes? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's time to cut to the chase. What is an array? As defined in the dictionary, an array is an impressive display or range of particular type of thing. Or as said on Wikipedia, and I kind of like this better for our purposes, an array is a systematic arrangement of similar objects, usually in rows and columns. So what does that mean for us? Well, if we think about these definitions, which basically says that an array is just a collection of like items in rows and columns, I mean, that sounds pretty easy, right? In fact, I bet we could find some arrays around us right now in the real world. Let me show you some examples of physical, real life arrays that I've put together for you and that you probably have around your home too. First, we have my super outdated video game collection. Guys, they don't sell PC games in boxes anymore, okay? <laughs> this is an impressive range of a particular type of thing, and it's a systematic arrangement of similar objects in a row. So this is just an array of video games. Because it's just one row, this is what we call a one-dimensional array. Let's look at our next example. Here we've got another one-dimensional array. This is an array of books, but if we wanted to be even more specific, we could say that this is a one-dimensional array of programming books. When working with arrays, you always want to be as specific and detailed as possible regarding the contents of the array. In this video, we're only going to be working with one-dimensional arrays, but let's look at a quick example of a 2D array because I think it will really give you a lot of extra content and it'll be a nice sneak peek for the next video where we will be going over 2D arrays. So here for this array, we've got two rows and four columns of rubber ducks. Similar to our other array examples, this is a range of similar objects in rows and also in columns. Because this array has depth created by the columns from multiple rows, this is what we call a two-dimensional array. It has width, but also height. So this is a two-dimensional array of rubber ducks. Now, if I were to lift this top row off, this row now becomes its own one-dimensional array because it's just a single row, right? There's not another row to create any sort of depth to create a column. Kind of like two-dimensional and 3D art. It has to have that extra depth created by that dimension. So when we have a single two-dimensional array of rubber ducks that is composed of two one-dimensional arrays, now, to create another example for you here, I'm gonna separate these two arrays into their own entities. So, this was previously a 2D array of ducks, but now that we have two unique 1D arrays, are these just two one-dimensional arrays of ducks? Or do you think we could get a little more specific? This top one is an array of rubber ducks, but more specifically, we could say that this is an array of rubber ducks with mohawks. This bottom array here is also an array of rubber ducks, but again, being more specific, these are rubber ducks with numbers. So, in a program, we might declare this top one as ducks with mohawks, 
and then our other one, ducks with numbers. Okay, but where am I going with this? Well, as a developer, there are going to be times where you run into two arrays that are unique entities, but they have to work in parallel, and these are called parallel arrays. A parallel array is an array whose indexes correspond with the indexes of another array. An index represents the exact location of a specific element within an array. We haven't talked about indexing yet, so let me show you. So earlier I showed you one of these cubes. Let's say this represents a single variable and, as we know, holds a single value. Here on this table, I've got 12 cubes. If we labeled all of these as unique variables, we would have variable one through variable 12. That is crazy. Wouldn't it be nice if we could condense or group some of these variables that are alike? So to do that, we're gonna use my very favorite prop, which you just saw. This is the array tray. And I call it the array tray because it's gonna help us visualize how variables are stored within an array and how that creates indexes. So if an array is a group of like things arranged into rows and columns, let's group and organize the variables that we have here into rows and columns, and then I'll show you how we're gonna put them into an array using our array tray. variables have been grouped into strings, ints, doubles, and boolean values. While this might look like a 2D array because of how we've laid it out, remember that at this point these are all just individual variables. Let's go ahead and make an array. Let's use some string variables. To take these three individual variables and make them part of an array, we're just going to put them all together here in the array tray. Now, what this does is, instead of having string variable one, two, and three in our program, we instead just declare a string array of three elements, and that is each one of these variables. The C++ syntax that we would use to declare an array looks like this. Just like any other declaration, we have our data type, our name, and then here in these square brackets, this is where we tell the compiler how many elements or values we're gonna store in this array. Since we have three here, we've got the number three inside of our index brackets. The reason that this is called an index is because since an array can hold multiple values, we sometimes need a way to tell the compiler which of these values we wanna access. Think of it like an apartment complex. It's one building, but within that building, there are addresses that reference a specific apartment number, right? The name of our array is the building and the index is the apartment number. So for example, our array here is holding the different type of pets. So I've got cats, let's say that I wanted to see out this second value cat to the screen. If I just wrote a statement like this, The compiler is gonna get choked up because it doesn't know which of these three values to pull. So if you had a job delivering pizzas or something and you get to the address only to realize it's an apartment complex, well, without an apartment number, how are you gonna know who you should deliver to within that complex, right? So when working with arrays, think about that because you always, always, always need an index as part of the syntax. In our declaration statement, we declared three because that's how many elements we're gonna store in this array. Now, we see it here in our call statement, three for the number of elements, right? So does that mean that if I wanted to access the middle or second element here, that I need an index of two? Close, but not quite. This is probably one of the trickiest parts of working with arrays. I know I've mentioned to you before that computers start counting at zero. Now, humans, we see something and we go one, two, three, but computers, they actually start at zero. So, they go zero, one, and then two. And these counts represent the index of where a specific element is within the array. Like, if you had a grocery list and item number seven was bananas, 
the index for bananas on that list is seven to us, but to a computer, it would be six. You need to remember that computers always start to count at zero because that first element in an array is always the index of zero, and that's a good base. The next one always has an index of one, and so on and so forth. So, coming back to our pet types, if I wanted to print the value cat, which is the second element to me, this is actually array index one. So, to access that specific index in an array, it looks like this. And here I'm putting index one in my C out, and that will call cat. So just to recap, an index is just the specific location of a value within all of the values that are being stored in your array. So how does this come into play with parallel arrays? Let's get back to our ducks. Good thing we've got them in a row. <laughs> So now that we know about indexing and are reminded that computers start counting at zero, the index of our duck arrays here are zero, one, two, and three. Looking at these, do we notice any common patterns between these arrays and the way that their elements are indexed? In the first index of both arrays, we have green ducks, and then pink ducks, then yellow ducks, then blue ducks. So let's say that here in the middle, we had an array of rubber ducks reading books. If I wanted to know where this pink one should go in the array, what index it should have, according to the structure that we've got of our parallel arrays here, we could say it's safe to assume that this is gonna go in index slot one or the second element in the array. Now before I let you go, I'm gonna give you a quick little challenge. Take a minute to pause this video and go explore your environment for some arrays. Once you really start looking, you can see that we have dimensional arrays everywhere. Go find them, look for patterns, see if you have some parallel arrays or if maybe you could arrange one, and I'll see you back here in a minute. So, did you find any cool multi-dimensional arrays around your house? Were you able to make any parallel pantry arrays? I hope it was really enjoyable for you in this video to have some tangible examples that will help you visualize the dimensions, recognize patterns, and learn to think in terms of rows and columns. Stick around and watch the next video where we'll be practicing the syntax for what we've learned today by writing a program full of arrays to bring our real life knowledge into the digital world. And remember folks, just keep sticking with this and eventually you'll be just like graduate duck hair with an array full of skills and everything you need to know to succeed. You can do it. See you next time.